All right, good, good, good. I see, I don't see anybody, but uh, Donnie, if you're really on, say hi. Caitlin, if you're really on, say hi. Elizabeth, say hi. Are you there? Hear me? Hi. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, good. I got to turn this up because I don't know if I can hear you there. All right, if you were saying anything, say it again. Can you hear us? Oh, there's, I hear Elizabeth. All right. Okay. Good. Oh, I see Donnie there now. So there's Don. Good. Good. Hello. Perfect. Let me turn this down. I'll turn it back up in a minute. Okay, what do y'all want? Um, I, we don't normally, I don't normally uh, kind of give in to the democratic process when it comes to uh, professional kitchen. But uh, today, right now, I'll, uh, I'll leave this to the masses. And right now, you three are the masses, so you'll make the decision for the whole class. We can cut um, all together. I can show a little cut, and you can work on that cut. Um, or I can demo all of it. Uh, you can ask questions while I go. And then uh, you can cut at your leisure. Uh, what do you want to do? How many of you, uh, uh, at least you three, how many uh, were able to get to the culinary school and pick up, uh, pick up your product? I was. Okay. I did. You two did. Don, did you get your product from the culinary school? Yes, yeah, chef. Is the shrimp and the all that other stuff? Yes. <laughs> Okay, yes, then yes, I picked it up last night. Okay. We are not, uh, I'll explain later uh, kind of the whys and the wherefores. We are not going to make uh, the curry together. I'll explain to you, no, I'll explain to you what to do. You, you will make the curry. You will need the cuts that we're going to do. Remember, the main feature of this class, the main goal of this class is uh, knife skills. And so starting this week, I'm giving you product that you can use um, to use the cuts that we generate in class um, instead of just tossing them or figuring something out on your own. Um, you'll be able to use these cuts in uh, a particular dish. And so uh, this curry is one. I'll, uh, I'll walk you through step by step. I'll put it in, uh, I'll type it in the chat too. Um, it's so quick and simple and easy and quick. Um, uh, we're just not gonna do it all together. We're, we're gonna do the cuts. So uh, still the original question uh, stands. Do you wanna cut together? Or uh, do you want me to demo and away you go? I prefer you to demonstrate it. Okay, demo. I'm good with demo and away we go. For demo. I'm good with it. That's a unanimous vote. And I've got 535, so that's enough waiting. We'll, we'll dive right in. I think demo is probably going to be best tonight anyway, because I didn't necessarily prepare everybody with, uh, hey, you need to get ice in an ice bath. You need to get uh, you need to get a saucepan with boiling water and blah, blah, blah. So um, here we go. I am going to. Uh, I'm going to work in this order. Uh, I'm going to cut. Let me put this in the chat too. So you can see um, how these things are spelt. Um, and 
also how you say these. And you'll be able to go back to this recording. All of these cuts were pre-recorded and they're in Blackboard uh, now anyway, but um, this will be just an additional resource for you. So we are going to... Hey, Chef, I forgot. I knew that we had class, but I also forgot. So I'm just gonna wear this shirt. Okay, well, that, that's okay, since I'm just gonna demo and we're, okay. we're not necessarily gonna cut all together. Um, so, so, um, that's okay. okay. We're going to chiffonade spinach. We're going to concasse tomato. We're going to mince garlic. We're going to paste garlic and then Uh, we're going to do a uh, citrus supreme uh, from the culinary school. You did not get an orange and it's quality and price right now. You should not have gotten an orange. Did you get an orange? Right. I'm going to show you. Yes, you got a lime. The lime is for the, uh, uh, the lime is for the uh, curry. I'll explain that uh, later. I'll explain that in a minute. Okay. So I'm going to do this in exactly not this order. Um, I'm going to chiffonade the spinach first, and then I'm going to move to the garlic. Um, and so we're going to mince and then we're going to paste. Okay. Um, yeah, Donnie, go ahead. I still have one of those grapefruit from last week. Can I use that? Uh, sure. In lieu of the orange. Uh, yeah, it's it's gonna be the same thing. I uh, I uh, I'm just now. What we decided was demo, right? So I'm just gonna not breeze through. I'm but I'm gonna demo these, and then uh, you, if you have questions while I'm going. You will need to unmute and ask your question. Don't just uh, type it in because I'm going to be paying attention to the board and my knives. And then uh, y'all will just submit pictures. You will get an opportunity for some extra credit. Um, and so I'll discuss that uh, just before we end uh, today. All right. So let me make a couple of adjustments right here y'all I'm, I'm closing the chat so if you uh if you chat if you send me a message i'll get it at the end today so don't send me a message it would be better to just unmute your microphone and um ask ask me something and i'm gonna move to a different camera i think this is the right one Yes, and I'm going to pull this over here so that maybe the microphone on my laptop will pick up here just a little bit. Um, okay, while I can see you, just give me a thumbs up. Can you hear me just fine from way over here? Good. I'm gonna blow this up. Holy cow, Elizabeth, are, are you drinking milk right from, oh, that's water. I was gonna say, you drinking milk right from the, my wife gets onto me every time I do that. Okay, good. You should uh, probably see that nice and big and nice. I'm gonna get out some of this spinach, just a little bit, and this is the chiffonade, and what the chiffonade is uh, primarily is a garnish cut. It's uh, it's to make the dish look just a little bit nice. Think of uh, think of basil, thinly thinly sliced basil that goes inside of a tomato basil soup, and then a little nest 
of these thinly sliced basil uh, right in the center of the bowl on the very top, just floating on the top of this tomato basil soup. You can eat it. It's part of the dish for very nice color contrast for a dish like that. We're gonna do this with spinach because of uh, the time of year and the cost and all that. So I'm gonna take these leaves, start with the largest and move to the smallest and stack them up. We're using baby spinach. So it's not necessary to pull the stems. The stems are, are very tender. We'll cut down to the stems and then these stems will go in the waste bowl. Um, that one's going to waste bowl. Stack, stack, stack. And then a gentle, not too tight, but a gentle little roll. Like you're uh, rolling a cigar or uh, whatever other things that uh, you might roll. Now, we've worked on this cut. When rough chopping, the cut is gonna be kind of like a train, a choo-choo train. The knife is not going to leave the board. Your knife hand is in a uh, circular motion and you rock right against the, uh, the curve of the knife. So you'll cut, recover cut and recover. Using your uh, middle finger, or in this case, maybe your index finger, but curled under, needs to be curled under. Speed is not necessary. Speed is not the essential thing right now. Rather, accuracy is and precision, making every cut the same size. Every time you cast the knife, it needs to be the same width as the previous cut. When you get down to the end, where you're gonna get really rough chopped stuff, off to the waste bowl. Some of these little tips from the very first, very beginning, you might wanna pull those out. And now we have this uh, lovely little, so I've cut these, um, about the thickness of linguine. You use that as your guide um, or, or your thought. A good chiffonade is going to be absolutely no thicker than a, than a store-bought fettuccine. That's awful thick. You probably want to be somewhere between linguine and uh, vermicelli. Cut a spaghetti. Now, does that make sense? Give me just a thumbs up if that makes sense. Good, all right. That's it. That's the whole chiffonade. Any leaf vegetable, any leafy green, but it needs to be fairly tender leafy green. So spinach, uh, basil are the two things that are most common uh, for a chiffonade. There we go. One of the reasons I did the chiffonade first is because that's it, my board's clean. Now, uh, before we move on to the next, uh, the next two cuts, they'll both come from the garlic. Aha, I've moved everything around. You see one of the cameras here now, okay? Uh, let's chat about this for just a minute. Uh, let's have... Um, this is gonna be a little bit of an impromptu kitchen sanitation lesson. Uh, let's think about this. Y'all can unmute your cameras too, um, uh, unmute your microphone so we can have a little bit of classroom discussion because I wanna be able to ask you some questions and give me, give me an answer, what you think, uh, what you guess, but um, Tell me what cross-contamination means. Isn't that when blood or any other biological matter gets on another food item with the same? So like blood on lettuce. Yeah, um, that's exactly, exactly uh, correct. 
that is the main definition of uh, cross-contamination. So with that understood, let me ask this. Can I cut, here's an example. I cut some uh, spinach, then I'm gonna cut some, uh, I'm gonna mince some garlic, and then I wanna go chop some iceberg lettuce, and then I'm gonna slice a tomato. Can I do all of that on the same board with the same knife? Maybe, maybe just a little wipe in between, that's all. Can I do the same board, same knife, all of that product in a row? Just like that. What do y'all think? Okay, I get one thumbs up. You're talking all like vegetables at the same time? Yes, you can do that. But as soon as you start in Good. So um, now I'm going to chiffonade some spinach. I'm going to mince some garlic. Um, I'm going to slice a tomato. I'm going to kind of dice up some bacon. And then I'm going to peel and coarse chop some lettuce. So I got a nice little uh, BLT type of thing going on. And I'm gonna do in that order, some spinach, some, uh, some garlic, some tomato, some bacon, some uh, lettuce. Um, same board, same knife, boom, 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 all in the order. Uh, dry towel, just give it a little wipe. Is that good to go? Is the bacon cooked, Chef? No. Then no, that is not a correct order. Okay, the bacon is cooked. And yes, you can because it's cooked and the bacteria has been cooked off. No. Trick question a little bit, but um, yeah, it is uh, cooked or not cooked. Protein, produce, um, protein, uh, produce, 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 fine. Produce, produce, protein. The board, your knife needs to be completely washed and sanitized. You need to sanitize your, your workspace. Your, even at home, <coughs> your countertop, your kitchen table, whatever it is that you're working on, once you worked with protein, clean, sanitized, wipe, and then uh, go away. That's important <coughs> to note, <coughs> excuse me, um, something went down the wrong hole. <clears throat> That's important to note because um, we're going to do produce, produce, produce. And then in a little while, I'm going to cut you loose to maybe do some more produce. And you still have shrimp to do. And you don't want to do your spinach and do your uh, um, mince your garlic and dice an onion and then peel and devein, coarse chop your spinach and then go concasse your tomato, all of that on the same board um, with, with nothing more than just a white. The cooties from the, I just call it, I call everything cooties. So salmonella from, from poultry, E. coli, uh, the camphylobacter that's in the shrimp, all of that stuff is what I call cooties. And uh, cooties in food uh, can really make you sick. It'll give you a holy cow holy cow case of the trots and the kind of trots that uh, your eyeballs are going out of your exhaust pipe the kind of trots that's the reason why i don't have any hair on here because i might have got food poisoning sometime and all of my hair went out of my exhaust pipe you don't want those kind of trots and i actually haven't ever gotten uh, food poisoning but um i think it's week six five or six uh well, this is week five. I think it's next week. You're going to see uh, three videos from the USDA about some very serious food uh, poisoning cases that have left people, um, they're healthy again, but with permanent consequences of restaurant cross-contamination. This is an important, important deal. With that in mind, uh, and I know that these are videos you haven't seen yet unless you've worked ahead and that's great and wonderful. Um, let me talk about a different cross-contamination that your textbook doesn't address. 
that you won't learn in school, except from Chef Hall. And I wanna address it because this is a real situation and this is something that you will experience out on the street, okay? Today, there are all kinds of allergies. Um, every day, there seems to be one or two more. There are more and more allergies that, that creep up and appear in, uh, in restaurants and the customer base and when people are ordering off the menu. Um, 20 years ago, uh, nobody heard anything about gluten-free or celiac disease or gluten allergy, uh, wheat allergy. Um, it existed, but it was super, super rare. Uh, you follow me? Today, there's, I can't have peanuts. That's been around for a long time, but so many people aren't growing out of childhood peanut aller allergies, tree nut allergies, shrimp allergies have translated now into all shellfish, into all seafood allergy, um, dairy allergy, um, a little bit of lactose intolerance to full-blown um, holy cow case of the trots and uh, terrible things that can happen whenever you ingest foods that you're allergic to. And some of these allergies, people are so sensitive that, that it's, I mean, a microscopic amount of, of product can give you an allergic reaction, okay? So why am I bringing this up now? Because, Tonight, for our lab, all we're cutting is produce, 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 produce. The shrimp is part of something else that I'll address uh, in, in a little while. But who, who among you have heard of nightshade? It's a certain family of vegetable, nightshade vegetables. Isn't that a tomato? Do what? Isn't that what a tomato is? Exactly right. Yes. Thank you. Yay. Somebody knows. You've been the first one this semester that knows nightshade. An example of nightshade is tomato. So work with me here. Um, a guest comes into your restaurant, uh, orders a uh, fresh salad. You're a very high end restaurant, so you just don't chop up the tomato you concasse your tomatoes, what you're gonna learn here in a few minutes. Um, and the person has a nightshade allergy, so of course you wanna leave the tomato off of their salad. But they want your quick two order made Caesar dressing. And so when you did your mise, uh, to prepare for that day's service, you, uh, you cut your tomato first. And you just wiped your cutting board a little bit um, because it's produce after produce after produce. And right after you cut your tomato, you minced your garlic. And you have that minced garlic ready to do your, your very quick made to order, small serving Caesar dressing. Um, what happened, I'm not gonna ask. The tomato that you cut before, um, even though you wipe it up and you may not be able to see it, there's tomato in all of the fine little nooks and crannies in the pores of the cutting board. Uh, you'll experience this in just a little while. When you mince garlic, garlic's like glue. Garlic sticks to everything garlic picks up everything that's stuck in the pores and the nooks and the crannies of your cutting board. So your raw garlic that you're gonna use for the Caesar dressing that you're gonna give to the guest that is allergic to nightshade vegetables has microscopic amounts 
but it has tomato gack mixed in the garlic. Does that make sense or has this been confusing? This is another degree or another level of uh, cross-contamination. We don't address this in school. It's not, uh, it's not full. When you take your, I think everybody should be in food service sanitation. In your sanitation class, you won't even address this in sanitation. But I want you to be thinking um, at this higher level, just for the future, for, uh, for the good of your restaurant, so you don't, you don't get sued and you don't get accused of anything, but you keep your guests as safe as possible. With that in mind, it would be easy for me with what I'm cutting tonight, I've done the spinach, it'd be really easy to just jump over to the tomato and then do the garlic. The garlic's kind of messy, the garlic's gonna make me smell like garlic and blah, 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 blah. Well, I, I, this really isn't a matter of what's easy, it's a matter of what's best for my guests. And so with that in mind, tonight I do the chiffonade of the spinach, but now I'm gonna do the garlic because it's okay, say for a nightshade allergy, for me to get a little microscopic amount of garlic mixed in with the tomato, I'm not gonna hurt anybody. Does that make sense? Good. Let's mince some garlic. Uh, which one was it? Is that it? Good. Here we go. I have garlic. Okay. The root side of the garlic, where you have the little brown piece, we want to go ahead and cut that off. Okay. Just bury that little brown part, the root piece. Um, it, it, won't, uh, it won't sweat in the pan, meaning it won't get soft or translucent. And in some dishes, this might even feel a little bit like a rock. And so we're gonna get rid of it. If we can get it up on the knot. I don't have any fingernails. So it's hard to pick stuff up. Good. Now we don't have to go crazy. We don't have to go crazy. We want to smash the garlic. We want to smash the garlic so it doesn't roll around all over the board. If it rolls around all over the board, you have a tendency to, you know, use your, your knife and chase after the garlic, and that's not safe. You're going to cut your finger. Um, and so anyway, we want to uh, make the garlic stay in one place. And so we do that by just a little smash. I don't know if you could hear that with the microphone um, halfway across the room, but we're not flattening it entirely. We're just breaking the, the fibers up just enough so that it now won't roll around everywhere. And using the same mo motion as we up to now, that's all we're gonna do to this garlic. And I'm still using my guide hand to guide exactly where my knife cuts. Now I have this really, really coarse sliced garlic. And I'll make a line and I'll run my knife through all over again. Turn it, make another line. Every time you run through, clean off your knife. Otherwise, you'll get bigger, big pieces stuck on, and when you think you're done, uh, then you end up with large chunks. And even as small as we're gonna make this, we still want as consistent as possible so that it all cooks at the same rate, right? Maybe one more pass and
So I've got some on the knife. When you come back and look at this video, look at the recording, or if you look at it right now, um, I'm using the logo of the knife for you to have, uh, you can gauge the size of this chop. We're calling this chopped garlic. This is not minced garlic. Minced needs to be the texture and consistency of coarse, damp sand. Um, if you've been to the beach, Anywhere, uh, you kind of know what that means. If you've never been to the beach, well, uh, sorry, I don't know what else to tell you. The smallest possible rocks, just a step larger than sand itself. Uh, the smallest possible rocks that maybe you can put in a fish tank. That's not exactly right because that's about what this is right here. When we get this rough chop, okay, now we're going to use this motion that's going to be back and forth like a fan. And it looks like, it looks like the knife is a chop, chop, like it's, it's crushing the garlic. In reality, the knife is rocking back and forth because that is still the cut forward and down. That's how you cut, except it's really, really small. I'm going to have one point, the tip of the knife is going to stay in one place. That's my pivot. And my knife is going to go uh, back and forth like in a fan motion. I use three fingers. You will do this and figure out what's comfortable for you. I would recommend you not use your whole hand. If you use your whole hand and you do this properly, there's gonna be a little bit of forward motion and you run the risk of stabbing your hand um, and you don't wanna do that. If you're just a three finger person, you wanna be careful because your thumb and your pinky are just floating out here somewhere. And if you're not being real, real attentive to what you're doing, I've seen some pretty serious injuries with pinky and thumb, especially thumb, not paying attention and wow, um, uh, that's no point out. We don't want tomato gack in the garlic. Uh, we don't want thumb tips in the garlic. We don't want thumb blood in the garlic. That would all be, uh, that would all be bad. And so now, really tight motion. It'll take a few passes of the knife, just back and forth. Every once in a while, you want to scrape that blade so that you get the larger chunks off of your knife. You end up with a nice, consistent mince. Y'all see what's going on here? I hope so. I, uh, I can't see my screen, so. Yes, Chef. Hey. Can see it. Let me get a little bit on here. Spread that out some. I bring this up to the camera and you can see this in relation to the logo of the knot. You see how small and fine that is? Yes. Yes, Chef. With the amount of garlic that you have, what I would like you to do whenever you do this, um, I want you to save about half of your garlic mince. I'm trying to remember exactly what the lab uh, requirement is. I should have looked at that just before class, but I didn't. I'm going to move all this. Let me scoot this back just a little bit right to the edge of the cutting board. The other half, we're going to paste. 
All right. Now listen, I'm gonna get close to the microphone for a second. Um, what I'm gonna show you right now is a little bit complicated, okay? One of the reasons I like the fact that this is recorded is so that you can go back and review this again and again. You might need to review this part uh, multiple times just to get it and to understand. Uh, the first thing to understand is we are doing this because um, it is a classical skill. And at the end of the day, you're gonna get a little bit of a control with the knife that you may not get otherwise. But I acknowledge that even though this is a classical cut and a classical method and technique, today we buy already pasted garlic. Uh, your restaurant can buy garlic paste. You can go to Walmart. I buy them by the squeeze bottles uh, or the little squeeze tubes. I always have garlic paste and ginger paste. Um, and I use those at home for uh, Asian cuisine. I'll, maybe because I, I lived in China, um, you know, for the Olympics 12, 14 years ago, 2008, 14 years ago. Um, but I love Asian food. And so I keep squeeze bottles. This is something that I only do um, in class for culinary school. This is something that you might only do in culinary school, but I still want you to apply enough uh, time and effort and energy to practice this a couple of times to get this skill down because it also helps you develop some muscle memory and some dexterity that you wouldn't get otherwise. What we're gonna to try to do is break down all of these discernible individual little pieces of garlic. And we're gonna do that, put this in a line. I wanna be near the edge of the cutting board and I want the edge of the cutting board near or on the edge of my work surface, my countertop, my dining table, wherever it is that you're working, so that my knife handle is off away from the board. I'm off the board, I'm off the table, okay? My guide hand now becomes my press, my pressure hand. All I'm doing is grinding the garlic. The board is one of my grinding stones, my knife is the other grinding stone. And so, um, kind of like on skis, I angle the knife up just gradually, just a little bit, a teeny bit, and hopefully the glare of the light here will show you how little bit, I'm not lifting the knife up like so. I'm just angling it enough that I pick up a little bit of garlic. Then I press it, smash it, and with the whole face of the, of the blade against the cutting board, I spread it just a little bit. These are really short motions. My guide hand is pressing in really hard. This becomes quite a workout. Now I'm not quite sure what you're able to see in the cutting board, but there's a lot of still, uh, there, there's quite a few, uh, I, I didn't do very much, but spread this out and start to smash it. So now I'm gonna go the other direction and I'm using the blade side, the sharp side of my blade. And I'm picking some up and press and spread. It's always press and spread back and forth. That spreading is my grinder. I'm gonna do this back and forth until I start to hear water and I start to see water. And I really don't see garlic on my board. 
when I scrape it with my knife, scrape the board, Now, let's put that up against the, the logo and see how smooth that is. It's really, really damp. Um, it's pretty smooth. Um, basic garlic paste. Okay. Y'all have any questions about that? No, Chef. No, Chef. Wow. All right. I do, however, need just a moment to uh, kind of wipe down this a little bit, wash my hands. And we're back, almost. Wipe this all down and clean up and get a little more water in my boiling water because uh, you boil a lot of that way. That's better. All right, that's good. Okay, like I said before, I'm okay with uh, a little bit of, I guess we could call it garlic residue on the board and follow up with tomato. I'd, uh, I'd kind of rather not have tomato and end up with tomato gack in my garlic that could eventually make somebody sick. I I'm just saying this because uh, Nightshade allergies is, is another one of those allergies that, uh, I don't know, maybe five, seven, eight years ago, there really wasn't, wasn't very many. And uh, rarely does a week go by that I don't hear of at least, uh, at least one. And so I don't know why, and I don't ask. In fact, until this water comes back to a boil, this is really a good thing uh, to talk about as well. Um, does it matter to us in, in the back of the house, in a, in a professional kitchen, does it really matter to us at all why somebody asks for dot, dot, dot? If somebody says, I'm, I'm gluten-free, um, is, is it right? for us to say, well, are you just losing weight or do you really have a disease? Did, did a doctor uh, prescribe something to you or diagnose you? What's your diagnosis? Yeah, no. okay. Say, who was that, Elizabeth? Yep. Yeah, that, that's okay. Um, just remember that. If you want to be, uh, you want to own your own place, whether it's a food truck or a restaurant or whatever. If you want to be a, uh, you want to be an executive chef with a good reputation, then a customer asks for dot dot dot, and with a smile on your face, you do your very best to provide dot dot dot, whatever that is. Um, 
if you're grilling a steak and next semester, uh, I'm promise you, you're going to grill some steaks. This week was ribeye steak, ribeye uh, week in food too. And so um, I'm just sharing this stuff, what you guys had to look forward to. This was grilling ribeye, roasting fingerling potatoes, steaming broccoli, um, learning to make compound butter that went over the hot grilled medium rare ribeye steaks and melted all over the place. Okay. You're going to have guests that are going to come into your place and they're going to order the steak and they're going to order it medium well. And when you bring it out to them or the server brings it out to them, they're going to ask y'all got ketchup. And, uh, um, what's your answer when somebody said, y'all got some ketchup for me? Yes. Get out the door. What? Get out the door? Yeah. We don't do that around here. You know yes. what? I'm not here to tell you what is right. I know, uh, I know one really, really well. I mean, uh, not a best friend, but, uh, uh, pretty dang close. I, I know a chef here in Little Rock. And uh, he exactly would chase you out of his place if you ordered the steak and you asked for ketchup. You don't come into his place. Um, he's a chef, and uh, you don't ruin his his great work by covering up with ketchup. And he and I um, have debated this, and and we do from time to time. I personally, I'll just tell you for full disclosure, I do not put ketchup on a steak. Not the greatest fan of A1 or Heinz 57. I keep it at home because my wife likes those. And I want the people that eat my food to be happy. And that means when somebody orders uh, a steak and they want ketchup, I'm the one that brings the ketchup out to them. And if I don't, in my own restaurant, my first restaurant that I owned in uh, St. George, Utah, I had uh, um, uh, a Smith's. I went blank for a minute. It's uh, it's a Utah, it's out west equivalent of a Kroger. It's the same parent company. But I had Smith's, I mean, uh, a parking lot away, just right out my back door. And uh, I've had people order ketchup and I go out my back door, I walk, run over to Smith's and I buy a bottle of ketchup and I bring it to them with a smile on my face. If you're one of those people, um, I will laugh at you behind your back after you're gone. You won't know it, but I will give you in my restaurant exactly what you want. I'll do my very best to, to please you and make you happy. And hopefully you're a returning customer and you will tell other people about me and my place and all of that. Okay. That was a, uh, that was a nice little uh, kill some time until we got water boiling again. And let's come back to the cutting board. And uh, conca save, go back to the chat. Um, you'll see how to spell that word. It's a French word that means, um, I actually don't know what the literal translation of conca save is, but what it means in culinary terms is peel and seed a tomato and then rough chop it. And so this is how we peel it. So you got the stem side of the tomato and the butt side of the tomato. Sharp knife, we're just gonna score the skin, kind of make an X. Just make an X. I don't know if you, can you see that? Yes, chef. Just through the skin, okay? Well now watch this. Next camera. We're gonna drop the tomato in rolling, boiling water. Not just hot water, it needs to be rolling, boil. Okay, we are not cooking the tomato. If we let the tomato get hot, um, we did this wrong. This should really only take about, uh, you know, it really depends. It depends on uh, the type of tomato, 
the firmness, the ripeness, the juiciness versus the, the meatiness. Um, okay, you see how now that skin is starting to pull away? It's open yes. up. We want to give this just maybe 30 seconds longer. So if you time this, uh, we were what? Uh, maybe a minute. We're going to be a total, this particular tomato, we're going to be a total of maybe a minute and a half to two minutes. Um, that doesn't mean that when you concasse your tomato, it's going to be a minute and a half or two minutes. Now I have that opened up and I've got uh, kind of wrinkled skin all around. I want that wrinkled skin. Now I'm going to drop it in the ice bath and I'll turn the burner off. This ice bath um, to parboil a vegetable in uh, boiling water um, and then immediately dropping that vegetable in an ice bath is by definition called a blanch. Um, and I know there's an echo in here, so let me go back to the chat, maybe. There we go. Blanche. Uh, this is something you're going to repeat and you're going to learn. Um, you'll do a lot in food too. We blanch green beans before we saute them. Um, we're going to we're going to blanch asparagus before we roast it or grill it. Uh, we do a lot of blanch. Okay. What the, what the ice bath does is quickly stop whatever cooking has started and locks in color. So to a green bean or to asparagus or even to broccoli, that renders that green vegetable a beautiful green that's going to uh, remain versus um, opening up a can that's already cooked and then cooking it some more and it ends up on your plate gray and mushy. You know what I mean? And so here we're going to take this right on back to our cutting board and let's move over there. Now, so I have my waste bowl and I have this uh, peeling back wrinkled skin that just peels right away, nice and easy. I pull it off of the stem side. There we go, that's done. I return to my big knife and uh, now I'm gonna take this and cut it in quarters. The center, all of this, it's cold. It's a little bit slippery. I personally did not know that you could peel a tomato. Well, you just, now you learned something new. Who said that? Was that Elizabeth? It was. Sounded like you. So yeah, now you know you can peel. That is classical. Classical meaning it is very, very French. And the, that kind of chewy texture of the tomato skin is very off-putting in many high-end gourmet classical dishes. And so you gotta get the skin off. The same thing with the seeds. On any tomato, you've got seeds. The seeds are crunchy, they don't cook down, but those seeds are encased in kind of a mucus sac. We've gotta get rid of all of that. These are, these are different textures and we wanna get rid of those textures. So when, what I look for when I'm evaluating, I'm assessing, grading, concassee is uh, no seed, no skin. And if you have to do thousands of these, you get really, really quick at it. When you only have to do uh, one or two, uh, sometimes I sit here 
and I do this, and I think, man, that would be really tedious to do this all day long. But it is super easy. I want to get some of that seeded stuff, juice, mucusy stuff. Okay. No seeds. Rid of my waste bowl. And now these just get a rough chop. Basically, the same thing that we've already done. Uh, go back to uh, a couple of weeks ago and the celery and carrots. We're just going to cut these into a rough chop. There's no particular dimension, no certain size, no certain shape. If you want to do this in strips, if you want to do this in a chop like this, if you do it in a chop like this, it'll melt a little bit when you uh, saute it. In, if you're going to use this for your uh, for your curry, bing bong bang. We're going to come back to our cleaning towel. All right. Questions about any of this so far? No. No, Jeff. Okay. One more thing I'm going to show you, uh, we need to be exposed to, you're going to do this, uh, you're going to do this some in food too, whenever we do seafood, when we poach, especially. This is a uh, fruit uh, segment, um, citrus fruit segment or uh, citrus supremes, okay? Uh, we need to peel the orange. And when we peel this orange, um, we want to reserve as much orange as possible, not cut a whole lot of orange off, but we want to remove all of the peel. The outside, the color, the orange color is the zest. The white just underneath the orange of the skin is the pith, and the pith is very bitter. That outside, if you use a zester, that is bold, vibrant, vibrant flavor, uh, as well as a nice color. This is gonna smell really nice. This may get some of the garlic smell off of your fingers. Might not, probably won't. And that's quite okay. Welcome to the food world. You're gonna smell like uh, onions and garlic over the rest of your life. We wanna get as much of this pith off as possible. Without wasting any fruit. This becomes a little test of uh, how sharp is your knife. Now, you can save all this and you can make your holiday potpourri, or I guess you go to the store and call it a potpourri, but it's spelled potpourri, so I'd say potpourri, or uh, go ahead and make it go away. And I'm going to come back to, um, so I know if you've seen this um, in Blackboard, I know that the initial recorded video that I made of this, I did the segments with my chef knife. Um, I need to go back and reshoot that really because it would really be safer. It's better for you to do this with a paring knife. So use a paring knife. And I'm going to hold the, the orange in my hand. If I get it way up here, I think you might be able to see where a segment is, this line and this line. What I want to do is cut 
inside both of those lines to remove the wedge. But I don't want to keep, see that those lines are the membranes that surround the segment. So if, if I just, right at the core, if I just use my thumb and pop this open and start breaking off individual wedges, you know it's got that opaque looking uh, skin, membrane on the outside. So when you pop that wedge in your mouth, um, the inside just explodes with juice and flavor, but you have that chewy membrane that uh, it's not terrible, but it's chewy. It's not the same uh, consistency. It's not the same mouthfeel as everything else. Um, again, in, in high, high-end food, it's, it's a lot about the mouthfeel. And so let's create really good mouthfeel by leaving the membrane attached to the orange. And so we're going to cut all the way in on the inside of that membrane down to the core. And then the opposite membrane, just to the inside of the wedge, okay, that knife should uh, follow the angle of the wedge all the way down to the core until out comes this piece. Can you see this? There's no pith, there's no membrane. I put two or three of these on uh, some citrus grilled halibut, and I use this as garnish. Nice color. Guests can eat this, and there's no off-putting mouthfeel. Okay. Versus, let's say. So let's say I do this. So I did it right on one side. I have no, no membrane, if you can tell. Um, I have no pith. Can you see how this is different? Yes, sir. yes. So you can see it. Yes, sir. You can see the, the color difference. You can see how this is nice and shiny and this has this kind of opaque uh, feature to it. That's the membrane. This you have to chew. This melts in your mouth. This is what fruit segment, citrus fruit segment um, is, what it is supposed to be, all right? Questions, complaints? No, Chef. Is it all as clear as mud? Kind of sort of. Yes, Chef. Uh, okay. Before we talk about the curry, is there anything else, anything specific you want to know uh, left over from today? Chef, is the lime prepared the same way, or are we going to cover that? I'm going to cover that. The lime is for your uh, curry. Okay. And what about the lime? What? What about Can the potato? Potato for the curry. Okay. Carrot? Did you get a carrot? Yes. Yes, chef. Carrots for the curry. Cilantro. Oh. For the curry. The onions. For the curry. Okay. <laughs> Coconut milks for the curry. Shrimp. Curry hey, chef. It's for Are we going to add the rice? Are we going to add the rice to the curry? No, cook the rice separate, and then on the, on your plate or in your bowl, uh, the curry. So let's learn a little bit about curry. And then, uh, Don, this is going to answer your question uh, for for real, for good. Um, curry, the term curry is Indian. So this comes from India. The curry powder. Did y'all pick up a little? Uh, uh, one or two tablespoons of uh, curry powder. Oh, you got like a quarter cup or so. That's pretty good little little portion there. He was generous yesterday. Great. Look, um, if you don't have it right now, get pencil and paper. So you can jot this down.
All right, we'll wait one more minute for Yvonne. It got dark outside. I'm afeard of the dark. Are y'all afeard of the dark? I'm not really afeard of the dark. I think I'm awake more in the dark than I am during the daylight. Well, Donnie, you were a soldier. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You were a Marine. I corrected myself. I caught myself as it came out of my pie hole. Thank you. And so anybody that served in the DOD, I maybe except the Navy, um, you, you go into the battle. The Navy people just, uh, they're on ship and they shoot big guns far, far away. And so uh, day, night, uh, I've, I've been around an aircraft carrier before. I've never, I'm Army, I never served on one, but uh, they're pretty well lit up. And so even at the dark time, uh, it's pretty bright. Okay. Well, I think the Air Force lights out is about 8.30. They got to get their beauty red. Uh, I think you're right. I think you're right. And uh, I know at least the Army does a lot more damage at night. Um, in fact, I'll tell you this. I've got a... Uh, um, I've got a license plate cover on the front of my car. I've got a, um, it's kind of an ode to my little brother's unit. I, I'm going to say this, it's a rabbit hole, but um, have any of y'all seen the movie Black Hawk Down? Long time ago. The two choppers that were shot down in, uh, in Mogadishu, in Somalia, um, were Black Hawk choppers that uh, those were very elite members of 3rd Battalion, 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment. It was my little brother's unit. And so I've got a front license plate cover on my, on my car that's kind of an ode to that unit. And the, the cover on the outside, the ring says, uh, death awaits in the dark. That's all I got to say about that. Let's move on. Um, and so welcome back. Uh, we return you to our regularly scheduled program. And what I want to do, if you'll jot this down and you follow these directions, the, if, if, we, if you don't get anything from me out of culinary school, all of this, if you, you need to take away, follow the dadgum directions. And if you do that, you're going to end up coming out pretty okay. When you go rogue and you do your own thing, then sometimes chef's not going to be very happy. And I'm not talking about me, chef. I'm talking about chef that you work for. Um, not going to be very happy when you just go do your own thing. Well, I want to make it taste like this, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to give you, I think embedded in this, I'm going to give you the recipe for this curry kind of uh, certain proportions, but um, there's not a specific recipe I'm gonna give you. Um, if you want a specific recipe for the curry powder after you taste this, uh, email me and uh, I'll send you um, my curry powder recipe. That's my curry powder. Um, it's uh, taken from uh, an, an acquaintance uh, became a friend of mine maybe a decade ago, Chef uh, Suvir Saran. Uh, Chef Saran is uh, from uh, a village in the southern half of India. Um, and this is food that he eats almost every day. And this recipe is his family's recipe. What I made for you, what I make for class is not as hot as, as I make because the general masses, most people are a little bit on the mild side. And so this is going to have, don't, don't go rogue. Don't think that this is going to be just, uh, just plain. If you, if you like Thai food and you go to a Thai restaurant, uh, this is probably a one. Okay. So if you're familiar with Thai restaurant, that ought to give you a little point of reference. It's not zero mild. 
Um, it has a little pepperiness to it. Uh, I just use crushed red pepper in, in this particular uh, um, this particular curry. I grow and I like to dry. One of the things I put in my curry is uh, my own Fresno chilies. I grow them myself, dry them, they get ground. But in here is just a regular over-the-counter commercial um, crushed red pepper. Little bit, okay. Um, there is a particular order that you build this uh, this curry, okay. I start with two tablespoons of butter, and just to make it easy, what I've done um, in class this week in person was uh, uh, just regular butter. In Indian food. Uh, in India, it's more common to use ghee. If you're familiar with that, G-H-E-E. -E. Uh, ghee is clarified butter. That's all it is. Uh, and all that does is take out the, the milk fat solids so that uh, the smoking point of that butter is much, much higher. You take the milk fat solids out and uh, the smoking point is almost 500 degrees you can saute, proper saute at a high temperature. And that's what you do in Asian food, in Indian food. This needs to happen in high temperature, okay? Once that butter is melted, before it starts to burn, um, diced onion. Uh, probably a quarter of a cup, three or four tablespoons. So this is going to be good practice. You probably have a whole onion, uh, dice both halves, and use about uh, this much of it. Uh, use about a quarter cup for your curry. Don't let your onions uh, caramelize. Just let them get a bit nice and fragrant, a little soft, a little translucent, OK? Now, how I've done this uh, before, and I'll leave this to you the same way. Practice rough chopping the carrot, but make your rough chops uh, on the small side, okay? If you make this on the small side, your vegetables are gonna cook all the way through. When I say the small side, you know, maybe about the size of your pinky nail. We're not working on proper dice or anything like that. Uh, maybe something about the size of peas and carrots. Make your chop of your carrots about that size. If you want to use potato, potato is a common, super common um, ingredient in Indian curry. And uh, if for no other reason, it's an inexpensive filler. Potato in Indian curry is like iceberg lettuce in a taco. I could serve you a little bit of meat and a little bit of cheese and a whole stack of cheap lettuce. Well, I can give you a little bit of zucchini and a little bit of carrot and a little bit of bell pepper and a whole lot of potato and you have something very filling. So, um, if you're gonna, if you're gonna use carrot and potato that, that you were given, then again, go with about a quarter of a cup each and add those right as the onions are starting to soften. I mean, your onions are gonna be in the pan for 30 or 40 seconds. Then drop your carrots and your potato. Let those all cook together for about a minute. And then if you want to use tomato, put in however much tomato you want. If you only got one Roma tomato, which I think on the cart you were given one Roma tomato, I'd put the whole thing in. Concasse the tomato and then put all of that in the curry. Chef, real quick question while you're taking a drink. If by chance I have ghee at the house, would it still be two tablespoons? 
If you have by chance, uh, what? G at the house? Yeah, I still go two tablespoons. Okay. All that all that's going to do is allow you, Donnie, a much higher temperature um, that you're going to be able to saute at a higher temperature. You're not going to burn up uh, that butter um, as quickly. And uh, even if for everybody else, if the butter goes a little brown, brown butter is uh, is very nutty, aromatic. It's delicious, divine. So that's not a bad thing. Um, after you've added the tomato, let it continue to saute for only about a minute. And assuming, assuming you're using um, carrot and potato, then you need to use uh, the chicken stock. And if you got, I don't, I don't know how much you got, you need about a half a cup of chicken stock and then turn the heat down just a little bit. So you got a whole cup, Donnie's showing just about a cup. Use, a, use about half of that, okay? Turn the heat down just a little bit so that the uh, chicken stock cooks in to the potato and the carrot and softens those. If you keep your, uh, keep your pan still on high heat, then uh, you're gonna evaporate the chicken stock way too fast. And uh, you'll end up with undercooked potato and carrot, okay? So assuming you're about medium heat or so um, on, your, on your burner, um, you're probably gonna leave your chicken stock at that, that point. Um, you're probably gonna go about, uh, three to five minutes and then crank the heat back up. You want to get most of the chicken stock evaporated. You'll have maybe uh, two or three tablespoons of liquid still left in the bottom of your pan. Very quickly, you're gonna add your curry paste and your curry powder at the same time, and you want to give that a good stir. Um, it's uh, you, you want to incorporate that everywhere with the curry powder. It's going to dry out the pan really fast. You want to work kind of fast. Once you add that, stir it two or three, three or four times, and put in the whole can of coconut milk. Stir it just a little bit to incorporate the curry paste and the curry powder, and you are going to smell. I mean, once you add the curry paste and powder together, uh, you're going to smell curry, and your mouth is going to start salivating, and you're going to get hungry like right then because it's it's really amazing. But you're going to let the coconut milk reduce a little bit. The way it's going to work is the, the bubbles are gonna be really violent on the very outside of the coconut milk, right around the, the top, the rim of it, okay? Right where it touches the pan. And gradually those bubbles um, are, are, it's gonna be a boil, but that boil is gonna work from the outside in and you let it continue to heat and boil and heat you, you might even get a little bit of circular motion towards the middle of the, of the curry. You let that keep going until all the bubbles reach the center and the whole thing is bubbly. When the whole thing is bubbly, add your shrimp, 10 seconds, then turn the heat off. Um, Let's back up all the way to the very beginning. To mise, do the mise en place for this dish. Um, when you do these cuts, you, oh, you can add the spinach anytime if you wanna use uh, your chiffonade spinach. 
Um, add it, don't add it. Um, it's more for color than anything else. You don't have a whole lot unless you got a big amount of spinach. And uh, if you want it, great. If you don't want it, great. Onion, all of these things you can add if you want it. But you need to do all of your slicing and dicing and cutting before you start cooking anything. Okay, prep everything before you cook anything, right? Then that includes, that's why we talked at the very beginning, produce, 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 fine. End with your shrimp, prepping your shrimp, okay? Um, I'm gonna post tomorrow, I'll give you just a, a video clip um, of peeling and deveining shrimp, um, unless, ha has everyone done that before? Are you okay peeling and deveining shrimp? Or I've never done that before, give me some help. I've done that before. Yvonne, have you peeled and deveined shrimp? Yes. I'm good with okay, it, Jeff. Good. Good, everybody's done it. So peel and devein your shrimp. Now you can keep the shrimp whole or to ensure that they cook all the way through, you're using residual heat from the sauce to cook the shrimp. Don't let the sauce, um, curry means sauce. It's Indian for gravy. So don't let the shrimp continue to cook in the gravy while it's bubbling, while it's boiling. You wanna let it sit off the heat. I like to take that shrimp and cut each shrimp down to about four or five smaller bite-sized pieces, okay? Now I've got something that's all about the same size, the potatoes, the carrot, the onion, the shrimp in my mouth is all gonna be about the same size. <laughs> if you do that, you've got great mouth feel. Um, before you, as part of your mees, before you start your curry, make rice. You've got a thing of basmati rice. Uh, how much did you get, Donnie? Did you get about a cup of it? Is that a full thing? You have about a cup? Yes, yeah, sir, if it's about a cup. The proper ratio of grain to liquid. So you have a cup of rice, two cups of water, bring the water to a boil, add the rice, Lid, check it every once in a while. You want the water to have just barely evaporated. Then leave the lid on while you make the, the curry itself. And then traditionally in a bowl on a plate, you get a, a little mound of rice and you cover that with the curry, which is like a gravy, okay? Um, does that all make sense? Is that all clear? 15, 15 extra credit points. I'll put it in as an assignment. The assignment will be for zero points. So when you do it, I give you 15 extra credit points and it'll show up as extra credit. For you to make the curry, incorporating at least your tomato, diced onion, and minced garlic. Whatever other stuff you want to add to it, great. Okay? I want you to make some kind of a, a, a plate. This is not about plate presentation. This is not about lines and height and negative space and all of that. Just present this on a plate or in a bowl. Snap a, snap a picture of it and you'll upload that picture um, in the assignment. I'm gonna create it just as soon as we get done here um, while the video is processing before I put it in, uh, in the Blackboard. And so you don't have to do this, but um, I'll do this a few other times um, throughout the, the remainder of the semester. We won't in this class always cook together, just like tonight. The purpose of this class is knife skills. We have to get the knife skills. 
But from here on, you're going to get product that goes along with the cuts that we do so that you can use those cuts to make something. Okay. Between you, me, and the fence post and your grade and uh, the assignments in this particular class, especially the online class, um, I don't care what you do with the other basket stuff that you pick up, okay? Um, what we cut in, in class, look at the lab uh, requirements. What is the lab assignment to upload? That's the stuff that you need to be sure you, you keep or hold on to until we have class and uh, we either demo, you cut after, or we cut together. That's where your grade's gonna come from. But every once in a while, I'm gonna wanna see something. I would like to see you use these cuts. And so today or this week is gonna be your first, um, I'll give you extra credit if you use it in the curry, partly because I love curry so much and I want you to love curry and I want you to get hooked on my curry, my curry powder, so that you come begging me for it and enough people beg me for it, then um, I'll start selling it. I've got students from two and three years ago saying, will you sell me your curry powder? I need to sell it because I need the curry powder. And uh, right now I just give it away. I give it away. So Donnie, you were gonna ask a question. I got curry powder or the curry paste. I did not get curry powder. Does that make a difference? Uh, yes, you should have at least one or two tablespoons of curry powder. Did everybody else miss the curry powder? I just have a bunch of different kinds at home, so I didn't. Okay. Caitlin didn't. Caitlin, you, you got curry powder? Good. All right. Well, I guess I'm running to heart. That or how far away are you from the culinary school? Greenbrier. Yeah, well, um, Harps is a really nice store. I, you know, we're, this is the fifth semester that uh, food production one has been offered online and it's been evolving and we're in a really good but not perfect place yet. And picking up product, getting the product is kind of the last step that uh, we're still trying to perfect. And, you know, it, it depends on so many things and, uh, all I can say is uh, I'm, a, I, I'm sorry when it doesn't work exactly great, like right now, you know, uh, you might have to pick up your own or use a different curry powder, but uh, I, uh, we're figuring out how to make it better. The day um, we may be able to do this next semester in the fall, we're working on this with the business office and fee payment. It doesn't affect you for this class this semester, but uh, we may, uh, we're waiting on word from the university. If we can do a section of food production one, the online section and not charge the lab fee. And if we're able to not charge the lab fee, you would have a grocery list so instead of paying, whether that's coming from Pell Grant or however fee payment is happening, many pay out of pocket. And if you don't have to pay, if you get Pell Grant or a scholarship, you don't have to pay the lab fee, that's money that's going back into your pocket. And so um, there are really just one or two, if, you're, uh, if your GI Bill, for example, um, you know, GI Bill is not going to put extra money in your pocket if you have less fees. But if there's no, if there's no lab fee and we give you the list of groceries, 
um, then just expect you to have the groceries when, uh, when it's time to do a particular lab, um, then the intention is to try that next semester and see how that goes. If we're able to do that, then we can expand this school to anywhere around the world. Because uh, uh, anyway, that's boring and y'all don't need to hear any of that. I do know that Healthy Foods did that. They, j they didn't pay lab fee and we just had to go to the store and grab it. Yeah, but Healthy Foods is not a lab class anyway and you have three labs, you have three cooking experiences, and uh, you can confirm this. Are you in the class right now this semester, Elizabeth? No, I already took it. It was supposed to be about, Latoya, you're in it right now? Yes. It's supposed to be where each of those labs um, are at or around or maybe a little less than about $5 so that after the three, you shouldn't be spending more than $20 for the entire class. Mm, I think it was the, no, no, that's about right. Because if you just had to get like 10 ounces of blueberries and raspberries, that didn't cost very much. Food's a little bit more expensive right now, but it's still, yeah. Well, and it's, it's yeah, gonna be going yeah. up. When I took it didn't cost much. Good. In production one, there's a lab fee in all the production class, in all the lab classes. So stocks, soups and sauces, gar manger, meat, seafood, food one, food two, food three, food four. Okay. And food one is primarily potatoes and onions and carrots and celery and potatoes and onions and potatoes and onions and potatoes and potatoes and onions. Um, it, Food one doesn't cost you $500. Meat and seafood cost you one lab. You're going to clean and break down a beef tenderloin, whole beef tenderloin. That's almost a hundred bucks for that one lab. One lab, you're going to break down an entire ribeye, rib roast. $300 for one rib roast. In uh, meat and seafood, uh, this week was whole pig. Um, you're going to break down and fabricate whole pig. And uh, that's hundreds and hundreds of dollars for each pig. Uh, meat and seafood costs, uh, costs the culinary school about Twelve to fourteen hundred dollars per student per semester. You pay five hundred dollars. So it all works out in the wash. But uh, anyway, what else you want to know? What else you want to talk about? Are you ready for curry? You ready to do the cuts, y'all? If you have a problem or a question, uh, if I want to go from. If I'd like to go from a one to like a three on the curry spice scale, do I just add more curry powder or more curry paste? Chilies. Chilies. You need to add uh, a different kind of chilies. And so I don't know about Greenbrier's hearts. I know Conway's, uh, Conway's Kroger on Salem, the bigger the Kroger marketplace, they have quite a nice selection of spices and you can get different ground chilies. You know, you can put, you can up just cayenne, which is going to impart much of flavor, but is gonna add heat. Um, you just want heat. Um, other chilies are gonna add um, other um, elements of heat, maybe flavor. I really love chipotle but I wouldn't put chipotle in, in this curry because of the smoky. I'm getting curry that is made with black cardamom versus green cardamom. Black cardamom has a little smoky hint to it and uh, chipotle would be a nice, uh, a nice pepper to complement. But most chili, uh, most curry powder is made with uh, green cardamom. And so um, uh, there you go. Uh, poor man's heat. 
around here, um, add cayenne. What else? Enjoy, have a wonderful evening. Um, enjoy the food. Uh, next week, let me know if you like curry or if uh, you don't want to do curry ever again anymore. And uh, you won't have to do curry ever again anymore in this class. Um, have a really great night. Recording will be up uh, pretty soon and so will the extra credit assignment. Thank you, Chef. Have a good night. Bye.